I'm Dan kurtz and this is the Foreign Affairs Interview. I think if we want other countries on board with our policies, which we do, spelling out the intent behind them is actually quite important. There's a near consensus today that U.S. foreign policy has entered a new era. But how to define and navigate this new era is much less clear. How to set priorities, how to understand power, how to reshape strategy. Richard Fontaine, the CEO of the Center for a New American Security, has held senior positions across the U.S. government, in the Senate, at the State Department and National Security Council, as an advisor to John McCain. There are few people who can offer as informed and comprehensive a view of U.S. foreign policy, especially at a moment when the United States is rethinking its own strategic objectives and sometimes struggling to find new ways of pursuing them. So you bring both pretty deep experience and a broad perspective to a very wide range of issues in U.S. foreign policy, and we'll get to a number of those today. But I want to start the conversation by referring back to a piece you wrote in Foreign Affairs at the start of 2022 on what you saw as the big failing in the Washington conversation about China strategy across both parties. And I'm going to quote you here after noting the the bipartisan shift towards a harder line China policy you wrote. There is, however, a glaring omission in the new China policy, an objective. Competition is merely a description of U.S.-Chinese relations, not an end in itself. Conspicuously absent from the flurry of recent pronouncements is the endgame that Washington ultimately seeks with China. That was a year and a half ago. Since then, there have been lots of speeches, lots of policy documents. There's been a national security strategy release, some high-level meetings between Xi Jinping and President Biden. Have we come any closer to articulating an objective for our China policy? I think it's still pretty vague, and I think it actually is behind where some of our allies are, the Japanese, for example, and we are a lot better at talking about what we don't want in the China relationship. We don't want total decoupling, but we don't want them to use our technology for bad reasons. We don't want them to do this. We don't want them to do that, as opposed to what the long-term vision is in that coexistence. And if you had to articulate what that objective should be, how would you do that at this point, given how things have developed over the last year and a half? I mean, I think the aim of policy toward China should be to ensure that Beijing is either unwilling or unable to overturn the regional and global order. That's a somewhat abstract goal, but it flows directly from the kind of world we want to live in, which is a world that is characterized by a global order that allows democracy to flourish, doesn't just have a might makes right kind of approach that uh, protects the sovereignty and the open economy uh, of countries and of the world and so forth. And we, I think, need to specify what elements of the global order we wish to endure. And I mentioned a couple of those broad principles. And then our policy should be directed at making sure that China is unable or unwilling to overturn those. That would leave a lot of other things that we might not have a preference that China is doing. We might not like it, but doesn't rise to the level of sort of outright opposition or trying to change and shape China's decisions. And things we might not like, but should, in your analysis, not make central priorities, at least in our policy, are things happening within China, whether that's treatment of the Uyghurs in in Xinjiang or things in Hong Kong or, you know, kind of domestic surveillance issues or anything else? Well, I think some of those would fit into that. I mean, I think China's general approach to human rights, which is characteristic of its behavior both at home but also abroad, is related to a core element of the global order. But I don't think that, for example, Chinese influence anywhere in the world would require an American response as if that needs to be vigorously opposed each and everywhere. It depends on what that kind of influence is, what it's trying to accomplish, where it is. And so I think making some of those distinctions and, and ultimately having a vision that other countries can understand and rally around. Because I think, too, this is a missing piece when our friends and partners have kind of an idea of what the U.S. wants in its relationship with China but not a very, very clear idea of what we're asking them to sign up to. And we really are asking them to sign up to, you know, a lot when it comes to these kind of issue-based coalitions that we're building. You noted that Japan has gone farther than we have in articulating a clear objective for its China policy. 
what is that objective and does that provide some framework that the U.S. should be signing on to? Yeah, I think Japan's objective is let's minimize the security risk that China poses and let's maximize the economic benefit that China can deliver. So let's get rich and stay safe. I think if you had to put it at a kind of shorthand here. And so that means that, for example, the Japanese may be willing on national security grounds, on safety grounds to take economic steps that they believe are required. But those are going to be relatively modest proportions of their overall economic relationship with China, because they believe that the prosperity for Japanese, that the Chinese market and Chinese capital can bring about is worth maintaining that. So they're not trying to reduce China's overall power, for example, by interrupting their economic relationship with China or something like that. I was in China a few weeks ago, and I was struck by just how universal the consensus among Chinese observers and policymakers was that U.S. policy has shifted from trying to counter China or compete with China to slowing down Chinese growth and hobbling its rise, you know, weakening China on some level. Is that an accurate reading? If not, you know, what would you point them to that would counter what is compelling in some ways? I don't think it's crazy. If you look at the October decision made last year that the Commerce Department put on the export of high-end semiconductors to China that would be used for supercomputing purposes. I mean, previous types of controls had been, you can't sell these kinds of things to the People's Liberation Army, or you can't sell them to particular entities that are involved in particularly nefarious activities. And those were relatively uncontroversial. These are, you can't sell them to China, no matter what they're going to use them for, whether they're going to use them for bad purposes or for fine purposes. And of course, something like the high-end semiconductors. And this looks like it will be just the start of a series of controls and reviews that will be coming out on other technology areas. I mean, these are some of the commanding heights of a modern economy. And so I don't think it's the intent of the administration when they did this to say, let's hold China down. Let's reduce Chinese economic growth. Let's weaken China. But the effect of these things over time, particularly if they become more numerous and the scope becomes bigger in this, will be almost inevitably to have some downward pressure on Chinese economic performance. And so, you know, all of the protestations that, well, this is not our point, that we don't mean to do this, is only of some solace to people, I think, on on the receiving end of this. That's not to say these aren't the right thing to do. I think ultimately they are. But I don't think we're the the Chinese are coming from on this is just completely crazy and out of the blue. Is it incumbent on U.S. policymakers to work to dispel that impression? Or is that, should we just kind of accept that as an inevitable byproduct of things we need to do to our own national security and not, you know, I think one argument the administration would make is that we shouldn't be quite so sensitive about how the Chinese might react or what they say in response to our policy decisions. But it does risk setting off a kind of downward spiral that we may be caught in at the moment. Well, I think if we want other countries on board with our policies, which we do, spelling out the intent behind them is actually quite important. Like I said, to those on the receiving end of these policies, it may not matter all that much whether the intent is one thing or another, as long as you are subject to the effect. But, you know, if you take, for example, all the semiconductor controls, the U.S. government wanted the Netherlands and Japan on board because unilateral controls would be at a minimum much less effective. But countries are just not going to sign up to an overall policy that aims to hold China down as a overarching strategic objective and economic objective. They have been, at least in some instances, and I think will be in the future, willing to sign up for, for example, controls on the export of technology if the technology in question is being used to achieve better surveillance against the Chinese people that in a way that's violative of human rights or is being used in weapon systems that could threaten their neighbors. And so there, I think it really does matter that we articulate why it is that we're doing this. I also think it matters just for the American people not so much in some of these arcane questions of export controls and what rules you're going to put in place. But again, getting back to the kind of first question, what is it that we're after here? What is the future vision of a world in which both the United States and China, most likely run by the Chinese Communist Party, exist at the same time? What is it that we're trying to get at here? 
it does seem in in evaluating the Biden foreign policy over these last couple of years that its work on building alliances and starting new partnerships and new kinds of configurations has been, I think, probably one of the the great successes. And that's true in the case of the response to Ukraine, but also in Asia. What do you think accounts for that success? And to what extent, you know, to to go back to this notion of articulating clear objective, some of the alliance building seems to be enabled by ambiguity about exactly what we're after. Can you sustain the progress that we've seen in that kind of partnership and alliance building without, you know, trying to kind of massage the differences between objectives and approaches to China? Yeah, I think Chinese behavior over the past few years has made many of these things possible, but it didn't make them inevitable. And so I think diplomats and leaders in the administration and in the other countries in question deserve a significant amount of credit for having seized this opportunity. The big question is if China puts the wolf warrior approach aside somehow and is more in the vein of cultivating countries as opposed to alienating them, then what's the potential for the United States to continue this pattern of success? I've been wondering about that for going on two years now, and I still haven't seen the Chinese move toward a overall policy of cultivation as opposed to alienation. So maybe it's a useless question, but I do think a different environment would make it more difficult to sign countries up for these kinds of things. I'm going to linger on the the India piece of this for a second, because this in some ways has been maybe kind of surprising focus for the Biden administration, given uh, all else going on in the world. It's also something that you've been working on in one form or another for a couple of decades, long before I think India got this much focus in the U.S. foreign policy conversation. I think there are kind of two interesting dimensions of where we see the U.S. policy conversation on India at, at this moment. One is this question about whether we are expecting too much of India. The second is the extent to which we are willing to overlook democratic backsliding in India, even with the Biden administration that is very uh, eager to talk about democracy versus autocracy as the kind of framing battle in, in geopolitics today. And he was kind of struck by the total lack of any discussion of democracy or human rights during Prime Minister Modi's visit to Washington in June. So let's start with the first piece of that. What do you think we can expect from India as a element in U.S. strategy going forward? Yeah, it's a great question because one of the things that I've observed over a couple of decades is a certain degree of romanticism about the U.S.-India relationship. I'm one of those who I think is very optimistic and bullish about the possibilities of the U.S.-India relationship, but that has to be leavened by realism rather than romanticism. So it is not going to be the case that someone is going to come into a White House or and, and sort of deliver India as you know an ally or a strategic partner. And so I think there's some things that are off the table for the foreseeable future. I mean, a a military alliance is off the table. I do not think that we should expect India to play any sort of military role if there's a dust up with China. And I don't think the Indians, other than maybe providing assistance the way we did last time, expect the United States to play any meaningful role if there's another dust up between India and China on the border. But short of those kinds of things, a lot is possible. And then, of course, economically, I think the sky still is kind of the limit, at least theoretically, with the United States and India, although we're both in a protectionist state of mind. So that's why I say theoretically. But I, but I think there's a lot that's possible. But you might note that as I describe these things, we shouldn't describe it or think about it as, you know, the U.S. and India kind of standing astride the world, having harmonized all of their strategic approaches and everything else. Because for every area where we do agree, there's going to be a lot of frustrations just in getting things done, but also lots of disagreements, as you can see with the Indian position on the war in Ukraine and its disinclination to sanction Russia. And what about the the democratic and human rights piece of this? It was long a staple of of rhetoric about the U.S.-India relationship that the fact that we were both, you know, democracies, the world's oldest democracy, world's largest democracy, is the the line in speeches always goes. You've you've probably written those speeches, as have I. <laughs> that seems to be eroding as a, a a pillar of the relationship, given what is going on in India today. Yet Washington, I think, has made a decision, a kind of you know fairly uh, cold realist calculation that there's not much to be gained from talking about democratic backsliding or other human rights issues in India. 
and that it in fact is not much of an impediment to working with them on these kinds of shared interests, even if there are limitations there. Does that analysis right? Do you see anything more the U.S. should be doing? Or is this just kind of a case where the strategic calculations should overwhelm whatever concerns we may have about some of the democratic issues? Yeah, I think there's two parts to it. One is what you said, which is a cold-eyed realpolitik. Okay, they may be backsliding on democracy, but it's better to have them on our side than not, especially given that the big strategic challenge in the area is China. Okay. So what's the price of that? The price of that is not going to be to broadly, loudly say things about democratic backsliding, but rather to tolerate it. I think that's, that's one. I think the other is there is a perception and I think rightly so that such criticism publicly and probably privately too will at a minimum be ineffective and at a maximum will be caused to react in a way that is, from our purposes, counterproductive. Indian officials tend to be quite sensitive to anything that smacks of Western kind of neocolonialism, telling them how to arrange their domestic affairs and run their government and treat their people better than they believe that people should be treated. So I think it's it's real politic combined with the perception that if you departed from that real politic, it's unlikely to be very successful anyway. Now that said, I think there's a question about whether this can endure indefinitely because it is true that the liberal democratic nature of India has made it an attractive partner to the United States. And the less liberal and the less democratic it becomes, the less attractive I think it will become to American policymakers and political leaders. I say political leaders because I can see administrations coming in and making the calculation as the Biden administration has that, well, all right, there's some democratic backsliding, but we're not going to make a big deal about it because we really need India more than we would like. But the Congress, the U.S. Congress may have different views on that over time. You delicately referred to protectionist bent in, in both Delhi and Washington. Let's linger on the Washington side of that for a moment. For decades, trade and economic influence and investment was seen as one of the the great tools of American influence, including in Asia. That's obviously shifted quite dramatically in Washington over the last decade or so. And now rather than talking about trade deals, we're focused on industrial policy at home on, you know, enhancing our competitiveness and manufacturing back. When you look at our policy in Asia, especially, do you see looking at the trade-offs between those different focuses, you know, kind of some benefits, some drawbacks. Do you see a new model coming into force? How do you see the kind of state of U.S. economic influence given those shifts? It's bad. I mean, having pulled out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement and having nothing to replace it with, there are now two pan-regional economic agreements. There's CPTPP and there's RCEP. The United States is party to neither. Most countries in the region, including China, are not only trying to get into those regional agreements they're not already party to, as China is, but strike additional bilateral or group agreements with each other and with entities like the UK or or the EU. And American policymakers are not only not doing that, they're going around saying the big lesson of the past 20 or 30 years has been how bad trade agreements are that they focus on, quote, efficiency at the cost of all the other good things we want. Well, efficiency is economic growth. It's lower prices for consumers. It's more jobs for those who want them. So it's very dismissive there. So on economic grounds, it's counterproductive. And then certainly on geopolitical grounds, I mean, if one travels to Asia, you will hear over and over and over and over again how the absence of the United States from regional economic leadership conveys costs beyond the economic costs, that this is a signal of U.S. disengagement or unreliability, or that the United States can't provide for its friends and allies in the region what they want, where in Asia especially, trade policy is foreign policy in a way that it's not in a place like the Middle East or something like that. So there's both geopolitical costs and there's economic costs. Another thing that you hear when you travel in in Asia especially is that countries don't want to be forced to make a choice between China and the United States. You wrote a piece for foreign affairs last month arguing that in fact we are asking countries to choose and we should be more more upfront about that and more direct about that and set about 
making the choice more appealing for them. Walk through that argument, which I think cuts against the prevailing view in, in U.S. foreign policy discussion right now. Yeah, so it's become something of a call and response. We don't want to have to choose. You won't have to choose. And at an overall strategic level, sure, that's true, that there's not an integrated political, military, economic block that only trades with itself, that defends itself. There's not a, you know, something akin to the Cold War. But that's not on the table anyway. So to say that no one has to choose that is only saying no one has to choose something that doesn't exist in the first place. So it's really not true when you get to what matters most, which is the things that are on the table. U.S. policy toward Huawei was the perfect example of this. The United States decided it did not want Huawei to build out the 5G networks of countries around the world, especially those who are allies or partners of the United States. So the U.S. government went around and threatened a bunch of these countries in different ways by saying, you know, if you allow Huawei to build out your 5G network, then we will restrict the intelligence we're willing to share with you or some other things like this. And then China came in and in some of these cases said, well, if you don't let Huawei build out the 5G network, then there's going to be an economic price to pay. We can't tell you what's going to happen to your countries. Well, isn't that being forced to choose? I think that's being forced to choose. And you're going to see, I think, more and more of this, particularly in economic and technology grounds, see us on military grounds, where the UAE was allowing the construction by China of a facility that looked an awful lot like a precursor to a base. The U.S. said, cut it out. And they had to decide, say no to the Americans or say no to the Chinese. So it's just a statement of fact that countries are getting caught between the U.S., China competition, and that's going to continue in the future. So instead of pretending that choice doesn't exist, my view is let's make it as easy as possible for countries to choose the right way, our, our position. And you can do that by creating alternatives to what they would otherwise have available to them, by demonstrating that you're going to support these countries and sort of be there over the long run, as opposed to, you know, lurching from policy to policy and, and jarring. So if they do choose the United States, then they don't regret it two years later and, and things like that. So that I think would be a, a more sensible approach to what I think is going to be an increasingly frequent set of forced choices. We'll be back after a short break. Iraq Disarmed, the story behind the story of the fall of Saddam is a political thriller-esque story of the disarmament of Iraq, which ultimately led to the fall of Saddam Hussein and the rise of ISIS. In this book, author Rolf Akiyus, former executive chair of the UN Special Commissions on Iraq, states, the quest to disarm Iraq took place between two wars, one justified and right, the other a dreadful mistake, a violation of international law that led to hundreds of thousands of deaths. You can order Iraq Disarmed from Lynn Reiner Publishers at reiner.com. That's R-I-E-N-N-E-R dot com, as well as on Amazon. So we'll stick with the theme of choices, but I want to shift our attention a little bit towards the West. There is an argument in Washington, especially in parts of the Republican Party, the notion that our focus on Ukraine over the last year and a half has distracted us from shoring up deterrence and shoring up our presence in Asia. Do you see any validity to that argument? How do you weigh what I think will be one of the big fault lines in foreign policy debate over the next year as we head towards the 2024 presidential election? Overall, I don't agree with that interpretation. I mean, it is true that resources are finite. So for every set of weapons that the United States has transferred to Ukraine, that same set of weapons could not be transferred to Taiwan which is what I think some of the advocates of that position would have preferred. But that said, Ukraine's fighting for its life in a way that no country in Asia is. And what happens in Ukraine and the outcome of Russia's aggression there, I think is going to have significant repercussions for the way not only China, but other countries in Asia think about the possibility of a conflict in Asia. So if it turns out not only that Russia's intervention in Ukraine is costly, but that it is also ultimately unsuccessful. And one of the reasons why it's unsuccessful is because it drew the combined opposition of the United States and much of the richest countries of the world, the G7 and much of the West, 
that's a pretty important thing to at least consider when one is envisioning aggression in Asia. If China wants to move on Taiwan, they're not exactly analogous, but it does have some pretty clear implications. The other thing is that our interests are probably foremost in Asia, but they're not exclusively in Asia. And so I think that helping the Russians to be unsuccessful in their aggression is important for multiple reasons. One of the striking things about the Biden administration's response to the war in Ukraine so far is its ability to keep together a coalition supporting Ukraine, both globally, but also in Washington. You're sitting in Washington and have some sense of where these debates are going. Do you worry about the United States' ability to continue sustaining its support at the level where we've had it for the last year and a half, given the politics of it, especially within the Republican Party? I think that in terms of congressional support uh, for the Biden administration trying to get aid to Ukraine, it will be solid enough to be able to get it done. I think the big question mark is who is the president in January 2025? And, you know, as recently as a day or two ago, I heard Donald Trump say that something along the lines of he would stop it. There is a line of critique of the Biden administration on this question of providing weapon systems and how quickly we provide them and what exactly we provide. You know, there there has been a pattern over the last uh, year plus of resisting sending certain kinds of weapons and then ultimately deciding to do it. The administration will often counter, look, we're focused on, you know, the immediate priorities, not on, you know, kind of shiny objects that that tend to occupy you know, media debate about these issues or debate in Congress. How do you assess the administration's decision making on this point? And how how valid are those critiques as you see them? Yeah, I mean, the the problem, I guess, with their explanation is then they end up giving them those shiny objects. If you just kind of wait long enough, I mean, almost every system now, with the exception of attackums, that has been requested and at some point turned down has been reversed and ultimately provided. One can quibble, and I would quibble with the pace and of some of these decisions and, and have front loaded a lot more of this and given the Ukrainians more of the assistance that they requested without holding some back and then giving it later and all that stuff. That said, what the administration is doing, I don't think is crazy in the sense that they are trying to weigh the utility of a particular system against what they believe to be the escalatory potential of conveying that system. And that is an art. It's not a science. I mean, there's nothing that says, well, if you give this particular system to the Ukrainians, Putin will do nothing. So don't worry about it. Or that he will do something. And so really do they're just trying to cross the river by feeling the stones, I think, when it comes to this. And so while I would be more, I guess, aggressive in the provision of those systems, I don't think that their weighing of the escalation possibilities is is frivolous. So, so you wouldn't, I mean, you think there are critics who would wave away Putin's nuclear threats, wave away escalatory risks. You think that some degree of caution is warranted? To wave away the risk of escalation with the country that has more nuclear weapons than any in the world is just irresponsible. I mean, you can have the specific debates about whether the risk is actually there when it comes to particular kinds of assistance or actions. But if we didn't care about escalation at all, we could attack Russia ourselves. But I mean, there are not a lot of people, I guess maybe there's some that want to sign up to do that. But why don't we? Well, because we're worried about getting in a fight with a country that we spent multiple decades trying to avoid a fight with during the Cold War. And it remains, you know, especially at the nuclear level, a really bad idea for two big nuclear powers to fight directly. Linger on Republican foreign policy for a moment. You worked in uh, Republican administration at a very different time in the George W. Bush administration. You worked for John McCain, who for a long time was the kind of leading figure in Republican foreign policy before the Trump administration, at least. Do you have hopes for Republican foreign policy evolving in a direction other than the one Donald Trump has been driving it in? Do you see any kind of new synthesis? Where, where might it be going? I think there's a couple of things that have been going on. Uh, one is that if you look at the history of U.S. foreign policy after long wars, there does tend to be some pressure toward retrenchment or more narrowly construed definitions of national interests and so forth. The global financial crisis and and some of these other things clearly had economic uh, 
effects within our country with respect to trade and even immigration, I think some things like that, that then sort of lashed up with this you know, more populist approach and, and kind of very narrow definition, not only of American interests, but even, you know, who was an American kind of worth protecting, which was instead of an enlightened self-interest that saw Americans benefit disproportionately from the maintenance of uh, some kind of a global order, but that commensurately required disproportionate costs. It just was less buy-in because of the experience of the previous couple of decades. So what do you do instead? Well, you do a bunch of the policies and things that have been suggested over the years. The problem with those and with some of the things that Trump has advocated and tried to do in his office, is it doesn't make the problems better. It makes the problems worse. So we could say we're going to get out of NATO and we're going to charge countries for our defense and we're going to focus exclusively on the trade deficit because these countries owe us money and have stolen our jobs and all these other kind of things. But you look at the policies necessary that would take the place of these things. And does that actually make our economy bigger and better? No. To make it less likely or more likely that we can sort of manage crises abroad, I would argue less likely and so forth. So I think there's going to be some kind of learning by doing. And I also see some elements of Trump's approach as springing from the kind of big movements that I was talking about and others that are just pretty idiosyncratic to him. I mean, before he started talking about it, I never heard Republicans or, and, and never saw like a popular upswing demanding that NATO countries pay 2% of their GDP on defense. I mean, you know, and then he kind of made that a thing and it resonated, but you know, no one's voting on that. There's not like another candidate couldn't have uh, a different uh, view on that. I think trade is harder, immigration is harder, things like that. But, you know, as you see in the presidential candidates now, I think that you see foreign policy approaches that are kind of all over the place. You wrote a piece this week about the risk of foreign interference in elections in the United States and in in other democracies. This was an issue that two years ago, three years ago, was, you know, fairly central to the American national security conversation. It has receded over the last year or two. What is the state of our own response, our own preparation, and why do you think we need to integrate this much more into or have a much more international approach to this issue, given how vulnerable we still appear to be? Yeah, so we are clearly vulnerable, and there's certain level of vulnerability that we will always possess because we're an open democratic system. And if you look at the pattern of behavior and the kind of external election or more broadly speaking, interference in democratic practice that Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, and some others have engaged in, it's been continuous since 2016. It has not gone away, including in the United States. And now you're going to add, you know, other elements to this like generative AI, which we don't know if that's going to help countries that wish to meddle, meddle more effectively or not. Uh, But we're just starting to understand what that would look like. So when you put all this together, the, the biggest missing piece of all this is that the United States and other countries have always responded almost exclusively unilaterally. When there's meddling in the French election, the French deal with it. There's meddling in Australian politics, the Australians deal with it. In ours, we deal with it. And so the really the missing piece is this collective defense. And we do a lot to make sure that low probability, high consequence events don't happen. This is potentially lower consequence, but much higher probability. I mean, the probability that we're going to see election interference and broader interference in in democratic politics is close to 100% because it's going on right now. So what are we going to do about it? And my view of what we should do about it is to have some mechanism for collective defense among the democracies where they can coordinate their responses and actually impose those in cases where these kinds of things happen. It does seem uniquely challenging given that you have one potential candidate in the next American election who is under indictment for trying to overturn an election. And he has, of course, invited uh, or welcomed different kinds of foreign interference, at least rhetorically at various points. In some ways, you could say that the the chief threat is coming from inside the House rather than outside when it comes to this issue, which makes even that kind of effort even harder to mount. Yeah, I don't think that's the right way to think about it, though, because it's the kindling that we have in the United States that makes it so possible for other countries to throw matches. One of the big things that some of these 
predators want to do, not only is pick a candidate and say, all right, we're going to support this one and oppose that one. That's some of it. But it's also just to sow division and chaos and support extremist forces and, and divide us because then we're less able to devise national responses to national problems because we can't come together. Well, we're going to have a lot of kindling. We have a lot of kindling now. We've had, we have more now than we used to have. That's not going away. The worst case would be for outside actors to be able to weaponize our own divisions against us even more than we, we would do ourselves and be able to amplify that. I've gone back and read a lot of what you've written over the last several years, over the last couple of days. And I think that the kind of underlying theme, you know, the, the Fontaine doctrine, if there is one, is, is really contained in this article. The piece is called The Case Against Foreign Policy Solutionism. And you talk about solutionism and point to that as the kind of cardinal sin of American foreign policy. Just briefly before we close, explain what solutionism is and why you see that as, as such a kind of core failing of how we approach this whole set of issues. Solutionism is the impulse to try to solve an intractable foreign policy challenge Sometimes by convincing yourself that the only reason it hasn't been solved is because the ignoramuses who were in government before didn't have the clarity of thought that you have or didn't try hard enough or whatever, um, rather than the problem itself is insoluble. Uh, so you take, for example, some of the things it is, of course, remains a mantra that we will achieve the complete, irreversible and verifiable denuclearization of North Korea. They, at some point, if we just put in place enough carrots and sticks, will hand over their nuclear weapons and we won't have that problem anymore. Or there will be um, a Middle East peace process that leads to a two-state solution between Israelis and Palestinians uh, that uh, sort of obviates this longstanding dispute that go has gone on for so long. And you can pick some, some other examples of this. And it's not to say that if the opportunity to actually get one of those things was at hand, we shouldn't seize it by all means. It's just that the opportunity to seize those are not actually at hand and they haven't been in hand. And that has not stopped administrations from putting a lot of time, effort and diplomatic capital at trying to do exactly what seems on its face to be impossible at the time. So if you're not going to solve these things because they're not solvable, then what do you do instead? Well, what you do instead is try to make the situation better than it would be otherwise. Now, what I describe tends to sound annoyingly pragmatic, borderline defeatist, and at worst, you know, maybe downright un-American. Because, I mean, what do Americans do? We get under the hood and we fix things. I mean, you know, with big ideas and boldness and, and it need not be incommensurate with boldness and, and breakthroughs and seizing opportunities when they're there. But it is, I guess, a caution to only do that when there's a reasonable chance of those kinds of breakthroughs happening rather than imagining that they exist where they, in fact, do not and allocating your time and diplomatic energies in the wrong place. That may not be an inspiring uh, campaign slogan, but it's probably a good principle for uh, for foreign policy action. So let's close there. Richard, thanks so much for doing this and for the slew of great pieces you've done for FA over the last several months and years. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening. You can find the articles that we discussed on today's show at foreignaffairs.com. The Foreign Affairs Interview is produced by Kate Brannon, Julia Fleming Dresser, and Molly McEnany. Special thanks also to Grace Finlayson, Caitlin Joseph, Nora Revenaugh, Asher Ross, Gabrielle Sierra, and Marcus Zacharia. Our theme music was written and performed by Robin Hilton. Make sure you subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you like what you heard, please take a minute to rate and review it. We release a new show every other Thursday. Thanks again for tuning in. 